Hi viewers, this is J. Swami, Assistant Professor of Zoology. Today we are going to discuss the digestion of proteins. In our day-to-day -day life, daily we will ingest 50 to 100 grams of proteins with our food. These proteins may be ingested in the form of eggs, fishes, milk and some other vegetables, grains, dry fruits, soya, like that. And all these components, they possess proteins. They possess proteins. Today, in our topic, we will discuss introduction to proteins, composition of proteins, hierarchy of proteins, components, proteolytic enzymes, and digestion of proteins in various parts of our alimentary canal like mouth, stomach, and the small intestine. See the proteins and their structure. These all are the amino acids. So in nature, 20 amino acids are present like aspartic acid, like aspartic acid, glutamic acid, lysine, Arginine, histidine, serine, threonine, glutamine, aspergine, tyrosine, alanine, valine, leucine, isoleucine, methionine, phenylalanine, tryptophan, glycine, cysteine, and the proline. So these all are the amino acids. These are the building blocks of the proteins. Amino acids are the building blocks of the proteins. And how they are going to build a protein is the two amino acids, adjacent two amino acids bound with each other by removing a water molecule and they form COH bond. CO NH bond that is a peptide bond it combines two amino acids together how it will form let us see for example here it is a amino acid 1 and this is amino acid 2 whatever it may be the amino acid it fundamentally consists of an alkane group CH group and then alkane means it may be Propane, butane, pentane, hexane, heptane, nano, deca, like that. The length may be vary. And each and every amino acid should contain at least one amino group and another carboxylic group. At least, minimum, each and every amino acid should possess at least one amino group and one carboxylic group in general right now how the peptide bond is going to form is carboxylic group of one amino acid and amino group of another amino acid they fuse together combined together by remo removing one water molecule one water molecule is released out and there will be a formation of COH bond. The COH is nothing but the peptide bond which binds two amino acids together. Carboxylic group of one amino acid and amino group of another amino acid bound with each other by removing, removing water molecule and they form a COH bond which is nothing but the peptide bond. So like that 
there are various peptide bonds in a protein various number of peptide bonds are present in the protein see here the same thing amino acid 1 amino acid 2 and there is a release of water molecule and there is a formation of co nh bond co nh bond right this is the formation of the peptide bonds if in any peptide if there are two amino acids they are known as the dipeptide if there are two amino acids that is known as the dipeptide whereas three tripeptide four tetrapeptide more oligopeptide like that so if there is an enormous number of amino acids are there then thereby they are known as the polypeptides polypeptides then what is the hierarchy is amino acids they form dipeptides they form oligopeptides they form polypeptides and two or more polypeptides they fuse together in an appropriate manner to form a complete protein this is the hierarchy of the proteins starts with the amino acids and extended to dipeptides followed by oligopeptides and polypeptides two or more polypeptides they combine together in such a way to form a functional complete protein right and there are various forms of the proteins as we know if it is made up of uh, a alpha helical chain with different kinds of amino acids like the uh, here it is aspartic glycine phenylalanine glutamine uh, glycine alanine arginine aspartic cysteine leucine isoleucine tryptophan proline tyrosine serine methionine lysine like that there is a sequence linear chain of amino acids that is the primary structure and if it is a beta sheet then that is a secondary structure and if it is further more complex twisted tertiary and high complex configuration of protein is the quaternary compounds primary secondary tertiary and quaternary compounds we will see in the structural complexity of the proteins and then come to the enzymes which dilute the digest the proteins proteolytic enzymes proteo means protein lytic means lysis destruction degradation those enzymes which can degrade which can digest the proteins are known as proteolytic enzymes there are the based on the activity based on the site of activity these enzymes are divided into two categories exopeptides and the endopeptides apart from the exopeptides we also have amino amino peptidases and the carboxy peptidases let us see how they are named as the exopeptidase amino peptidase carboxy peptidase and endopeptidase let us see here this is a linear polypeptide chain a simple polypeptide chain which starts with the uh, which has the amino group amino terminal at one end and carboxyl terminal at another end so these all are the uh, internal parts now if any enzyme if any proteolytic enzyme if it cleaves internal peptide bonds of a polypeptide chain or a protein internal means endo endopeptides they are known as the endopeptides if at all they cleave at the periphery if the proteolytic enzymes if they cleave at periphery at last parts then they are known as the exopeptides they are known as exopeptides they are unable to cut in middle they are able to cut the polypeptide chain 
they can cut they can digest they can cleave the peptide bonds at the peripheral region so that they are known as the exopeptides these exopeptides if they cut the peptide bond towards the amino terminal end they are known as the amino peptide ases they are known as amino peptide ases whereas if they cut at the carboxylic end carboxyl terminal then they are known as a carboxy peptide ases right endo peptide ases are the enzymes which can digest or break down the internal peptide bonds of a long protein or polypeptide chain whereas the exopeptides they cut at the periphery at the last peptide bonds if at all they cut at amino terminal end amino peptide ases if at all they cut the peptide bond towards the carboxyl terminal end they are known as the carboxy peptide ases right both the carboxy peptide ases and amino peptide ases are known as the exopeptide ases but remaining all are the endo peptide ases this we should remember then come to the digestion of proteins in various regions of our alimentary canal so let us start with the mouth digestion of the proteins in the mouth or bagal cavity here in mouth as we discussed in the digestion of carbohydrates there are three pairs of salivary glands in the human beings and they secrete saliva right in saliva there are no proteolytic enzymes so due to the lack of the proteolytic enzymes in the saliva the proteins may not undergo digestion in mouth in the buccal cavity so we should leave it then coming to the next step digestion of proteins in stomach digestion of proteins in stomach so for the first time digestion of the protein starts in the stomach only because the parietal cells of the stomach the integumentary cells are called as a parietal cells the parietal cells of the stomach they secrete gastric juice into the lumen of stomach right this gastric juice contain two kinds of enzymes namely pepsinogen and proreenin pepsinogen and the proreenin are the two important enzymes which are present in the gastric juice which is secreted by the parietal cells of the stomach okay these pepsinogen and proreenin both of them they are in inactive form they are in inactive form all the inactive form enzymes which are proteolytic in nature they are known as zymogens they are known as the zymogens what is a zymogen let us discuss in order to get a complete idea about the inactive form of the proteolytic enzymes and the active form of the proteolytic enzymes for example the enzymes which are produced basically which are proteolytic are always in the inactive form for example if it is a pepsinogen the hcl comes in contact with the hcl stimulates the inactive pepsinogen into active pepsin into active pepsin why the enzymes basically formally they are inactive because if they are produced or synthesized in the active format what happens they digest the host cell itself they degrade the contents of the host cell and thereby there is a drastic damage to the host body in order to prohibit it in order to inhibit this all the proteolytic enzymes or the zymogens are produced in the inactive form for example there is a disease which is known as a acute pancreatitis what happens in acute pancreatitis is the pancreatic juice that contain four kinds of enzymes as we know they are 
ట్రిప్సినోజన్ కైమోట్రిప్సినోజన్ ప్రో ఇలాస్టేజ్ అండ్ ది కార్బాక్సీ పెప్టైడేస్ ఆల్ దీస్ ఫోర్ ఫార్మ్స్ ఆర్ యూజువలీ ఇన్ జైమోజన్ ఫామ్ ఆర్ ఇన్యాక్టివ్ ఫామ్ ఓకే బట్ ఇన్ ద కేస్ ఆఫ్ అక్యూట్ ప్యాంక్రియాటిస్ ఆల్ ఆఫ్ దెమ్ దే ఆర్ రిలీజ్ ఇన్ ద యాక్టివ్ ఫామ్ ఇనిషియల్లీ ఇన్ ద ఫామ్ ఆఫ్ ట్రిప్సిన్ కైమోట్రిప్సిన్ ఇలాస్టేజ్ అండ్ ద కార్బాక్సి పెప్పెటైజ్ దెన్ వాట్ హ్యాపెన్స్ ఆల్ ద ఎసినార్ సెల్స్ ఆఫ్ ది ప్యాంక్రియాస్ దే గెట్ డైజెస్టెడ్ ఆఫ్ అండ్ బ్రోకెన్ డౌన్ అండ్ దెర్ విల్ బీ ఏ ల్యాక్ ఆఫ్ ది ఎన్జైమ్ సింథసిస్ అండ్ దెర్ ఈస్ అ డిస్టర్బెన్స్ ఇన్ ది మెటబాలికల్ యాక్టివిటీ రైట్ ఇన్ ఆర్డర్ టు కీప్ ద బాడీ ఇన్ ఎ హెల్దీ కండిషన్ కీప్ ద ఆర్గాన్స్ అండ్ హోస్ సెల్స్ ఇన్ ఎ హెల్దీ కండిషన్ ఆల్ ది ప్రోటియోలైటిక్ ఎన్జైమ్స్ ఆర్ సెక్రిటేడ్ ఇన్ ద ఇన్యాక్టివ్ ఫామ్ దెన్ కమింగ్ టు ద యాక్టివేషన్ దెన్ వాట్ ఈస్ ద యాక్టివేషన్ హౌ వీ విల్ సే దట్ ద ఇన్యాక్టివ్ పెప్సినోజన్ గెట్ యాక్టివేటెడ్ ఇన్ టు పెప్సిన్ రైట్ నౌ ఫర్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ దిస్ ఈజ్ ద ఎన్జైమ్ ఓకే and each and every enzyme contain its own active site which actually interact with the substrate now generally if the enzyme when we say that is in the inactive form it is covered by some sort of amino acids the active site may not be exposed outside in the inactive enzyme what is the active site which combines with the substrate and which uh, lead the which results in the formation of the products now if it is the active site of the enzyme if it is covered by unusual otherwise uh, other uh, amino acids right now as and when the pepsinogen get activated by the hcl what the hcl does slowly the hcl slowly removes slowly removes the non formal amino acids which are present over the active site which are present over the active site right and thereby what happens whenever there is a removal of the amino acids over the active site the active site get open and it interacts with the substrate and the substrates get formed into products so removal of the covering removal of the mask of the active site of a inactive enzyme is nothing but the activation so now the pepsinogen and proreneine are in the form of inactive condition right now they should be get activated and they go for the digestion of various proteins right what happens to the pepsinogen let us see here this is the pepsinogen right and it is in the inactive condition it is in the inactive condition as and when the hcl interact with the pepsinogen pepsinogen get converted into pepsin which is active enzyme this pepsin acts upon proteins and degrade them into polypeptides and the peptides and the optimum ph for the extraordinary functioning of the pepsin is highly acidic which is in between 1.5 to 2 ph 1.5 to 2 ph then if some sort of pepsin is in active condition then what it will does the pepsin on auto catalysis auto catalysis it activates remaining pepsinogen into pepsin again right and again this pepsin digest the proteins into polypeptides and the peptides the optimum ph is the 1.5 to 2 1.5 to 2 right then coming to the proreneen what happens with the proreneen here proreneen in the 
in active form the pepsin itself activates the pro renin into renin right now this renin actually it is plenty of pro renin and renin they are present in the infants children those which feed on milk and the lambs of the sheep calves of the cattle all of them they have the plenty of renin and it is highly useful for the digestion of the milk right now the active renin the renin whenever get activated by the pepsin it interacts with the milk protein the protein which is abundantly found in the milk is the casein protein this casein protein undergo the digestion in the presence of renin enzyme it converted into para caseinate para caseinate it is a curd like precipitate okay for example whenever the child fed with the milk after 5 to 10 minutes if you get disturb him and they tend to vomit not the milk but a material which looks like the curd that is nothing but the para caseinate right the optimum ph for this also 1.5 to 2 this para caseinate in the presence of calcium ions get modified into calcium para caseinate this calcium para caseinate in the children that is digested by again pepsin enzyme into polypeptides and the peptides okay the pepsinogen get activated into pepsin pepsinogen get activated into pepsin and this pepsin digests the proteins into polypeptides pro renin is in active state pepsin activates the pro renin to renin this renin digests the case into para caseinate para caseinate get converted to calcium para caseinate in the presence of calcium ions and finally this calcium para caseinate get digested by the pepsin again and forms the polypeptides and forms the polypeptides okay this is a digestion of proteins in the uh, stomach then coming to the digestion of proteins in small intestine digestion of proteins in the small intestine so for the purpose of the uh, notes we will see the digestion in the stomach so initiation of digestion of proteins the zymogens so transformation of the inactive pepsinogen into active pepsin okay so the pepsin the activity of the pepsin c it cleaves it is a large polypeptide chain let us assume if it is a large protein it cleaves it is end as an endopeptide it cleaves at the sites of tryptophan tyrosine phenylalanin and the leucine the amino terminal end of all these amino acids get cleaved by the pepsin okay and if you see the uh, content regarding the renin this is also known as a chymosin okay it also uh, converts the milk protein casein into para caseinate okay so the process is known as the curdling making of the curd making of the curd then coming to the digestion of proteins in the small intestine basically the food which is present in the stomach is actually acid chyme this acid chyme actually possess the partially digested food and along with the undigested proteins the pancreatic juice comprised of four kinds of enzymes in the inactive form namely trypsinogen chymotrypsinogen pro elastase and pro carboxypeptidase all of them are the zymogens are inactive enzymes but they will be get activated into trypsin chymotrypsin elastase and the carboxypeptidase but the required ph for the activity of all these four kinds of enzymes is alkaline 
pH should be in between 7 to 9. 7 to 9. Okay. Then, all these inactive enzymes, trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, proelastase and procarboxypeptidase, they will get activated by an enzyme which is secreted by the walls of the small intestine that is known as the enterokinase. It is known as the enterokinase. So, it is now it is known as the enteropeptidase of the sacus entericus. Right? Now, the trypsinogen get activated by the enterokinase into trypsin. This trypsin in turn it activates remaining trypsinogen and the other zymogens like the chymotrypsinogen, proelastase, carboxypeptidases into their respective active forms. Out of all these four, out of all these four, uh, out of all these four, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase are the endopeptidases. They are the endopeptidases. Whereas the carboxypeptidase itself is a exopeptidase. Out of four, first three are the endopeptidases and carboxypeptidase only one exopeptidase. Then, if you see the structures of all these four, this is the uh, first one is the trypsin. And this is the chymotrypsin and this is the elastase. These three are the endopeptidases. Whereas carboxypeptidase, it is a exopeptidase. It cleaves the carboxy terminal of amino acids or peptide bonds. Right? Then what happens to the trypsinogen? Trypsinogen undergo the uh, catalytic activity of the enterokinase then thereby get converted to trypsin. This trypsin digests, degrades proteins and peptides into polypeptides and dipeptides. The optimum pH is 7 to 9. Where actually the trypsinogen cleaves? Just now we discussed that pepsin cleaves at the uh, amino terminals of the tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and leucine. Whereas the trypsin that cleaves near basic amino acids like arginine and lysine. It cleaves near arginine and lysine. So this is trypsinogen. Coming to the chymotrypsinogen. The active trypsin, active trypsin that activates the chymotrypsinogen into chymotrypsin. This chymotrypsin also acts upon proteins and peptides into digested into polypeptides and dipeptides. So this chymotrypsin is commonly known as the milk coagulating enzyme which cleaves the peptides or polypeptides proteins near aromatic amino acids like the pepsin. They are tyrosine, tryptophan and phenylalanine. See, once again you have to remember pepsin is the uh, enzyme, gastric enzyme which cleaves the protein at amino terminals of tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine and leucine. Whereas the trypsin that cleaves near amino acids like arginine and lysine. Chymotrypsin cleaves again near tyrosine, tryptophan and the phenylalanine. Right? Then coming to the third enzyme, elastase that cleaves the protein near alanine, glycine and serine and valine. Alanine, glycine, serine and valine. Carboxypeptidases always cleaves the peptide bonds near carboxyl terminal. So, thereby, due to the activity of the carboxypeptidases and aminopeptidases, the polypeptides, they divided into digest into dipeptides and amino acids and the polypeptides under the dipeptidases they divide into finally amino acids. Finally, all the proteins which we have ingested inside, they finally uh, broken down into small amino acids. So that, why? Because we should, uh, there are two reasons we should uh, clearly understood that, understand that. 
why the complex structured protein should be degraded into amino acid this is a question right first thing what is the first reason is the large complex substances which we will ingest they may not enter into our minute cells so that they should be converted into assimilable amino acids first thing then the second thing is every organism every living organism has specific proteins and a specific mechanism for the protein synthesis that is based upon its needs and necessities it synthesizes its own proteins okay that is they synthesize the non essential amino acids they produce okay and they form different kinds of proteins and if at all they want they take from outside some of the amino acids which are essential and they take and they uh, synthesize their own proteins now let us assume if we have eaten an egg egg contain certain albumins proteins albumins globulins okay there are certain proteins these proteins are made for the needs and necessities of the chicken embryo not for us okay we have taken the egg or we have taken the chicken or mutton fish soya beans peas milk whatever it may be what not all all the protein rich food now these proteins as it is li we are unable to utilize them right in order to utilize them in a proper way we should degrade them into individual amino acids and thereby based upon our need and necessity we may construct our own proteins so that all the protein rich food which we will ingest that should be get degraded into formal amino acids first thereby we will construct we will synthesize our own proteins that is the reason why all the complex proteins they should be get digested into amino acids so this is all about the digestion of the proteins thank you thank you one and all